I am Elle Penelope, author of Epic Fantasy and Paranormal Romance, and welcome to My Imaginary Friends, a look behind the scenes of an author mapping the worlds in my head and making them a reality. Hello friends, today is Friday, October 25th, 2019, and this is episode 38 of My Imaginary Friends. I'm Leslie. So I have an announcement to make. Um, My Imaginary Friends has joined the Frolic Podcast Network. There was a big announcement earlier this week on Deadline and a number of other sites around the story. So frolic.media is a newish website that was created within the last few years as a romance-based website. And so the, the podcast network is romance-centric. And um, I do write paranormal romance. My fantasy is, some will call it romantic fantasy or fantasy romance. Romance is really important to me, even though it might not be the center of my work but uh, I always plan to have some sort of thread, if not the main storyline, then an important part of the storyline of my work be romance. And I'm deeply involved in the romance community, in my local chapter, uh, Maryland Romance Writers and Romance Writers of America. So uh, I don't know how well or how, how romance-centered the podcast is, but I'm certainly happy to be a part of the network. and. Um, so far, it's been really cool getting to chat with other podcasters. We have a, a Slack channel that's pretty active, I think. I mean, not as active. I'm not a Slack person. This is only really the second Slack channel that I have uh, been in in any significant way. So it's cool. We talk about like equipment and software and podcast news, things like that. There's no one else that I really talk to about podcasting, per se. Um, so that actually has been cool. And in the future, there might be advertising opportunities. It's kind of the hope that, um, you know, to try to monetize, I think. And we'll see how that goes. But at the very least, I do hope to gain some new listeners. So if there are new listeners, welcome. Glad you're here. To all the old listeners, welcome. Glad you're still here. Thank you so much. There was an article, Austin Cleon who has um, books and a newsletter that I get every week, actually influenced me doing the footnotes newsletter for this podcast. Um, There was something I saw this week where he was talking about um, why he does what he does. And um, he said, I started doing this to find my people, the people who care about the same things that I do. In other words, you, thank you for being here. And so I'm just going to echo his quote, um, however long that you've been listening, thank you for being here, I really appreciate the space that you, and the time that you spend uh, listening to me talk about things. So hopefully I can continue to talk about things that are interesting and valuable and that give you some insights into this crazy thing that we do called writing books. It's like author life is real because it kind of does take over your life. You know, like there's other interests and hobbies, but I found that as I've gotten more focused on writing and started publishing, especially, almost everything revolves around that for, for better or worse. You know, like I do think getting outside of the author bubble is really important because especially the romance author bubble, uh, romance landia is what we call it. And it can be very intense and it can be very distracting. Um, and I'm sure that if I was deeply involved in the science fiction and fantasy bubble, I could say the same thing, but thank you to my people once again. And, um, yeah, excited about this podcast network. So this week's best thing is Watchmen on HBO. I had seen several people talking about it, I guess on Monday, because it came out last Sunday. And uh, I I didn't really have any intention of watching it. Like I knew Regina King was in it, and I think Regina King is a national treasure, not only for her Emmy award-winning acting roles, but for Boondocks, for playing Huey and Riley, <laughs> two little boys. I didn't even know she did voice acting when she did Boondocks. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I'd seen a couple people posting about it. And, and, you know, I see people posting about things. I I kind of look at who they are. So they were people that I was like, oh, okay, I really respect their opinion and taste about things. So maybe I will give Watchmen a try. And uh, I actually had to convince my husband to watch it because he wasn't interested. And I was like, really? But since he did owe me, (laughs) he owed me several watchings. Um, listen to last week's episode. We sat down and we watched it, and I really, really enjoyed the first episode. At the end of it, he was like, when did this come out? And I was like, yesterday. He was like, oh no, we're watching it in real time. We can't binge it. 
And I was like, no, if we've got to watch it in real time, like the old days, you know, every week we've got to wait for that episode to come out. Um, but I, I appreciate sort of the anticipation because sometimes binging, I do think we kind of lose something in binging shows. The antici- There's something to be said for the anticipation and for taking some time over the week to think about the episode and, you know, gather your thoughts about it as opposed to just plus- pressing play on the next one. Watchmen, no, I, I, I don't really read comic books, but I'd seen the original movie and I don't remember anything about it. It didn't leave a strong impression on me. I, I'd, I'd read that the show begins with the 1921 Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street massacre. And that was enough to be intriguing. And, and, and so specifically the people that I had seen talking about that said how they did it well. And so you open with this, you know, something that I never learned about in history class. I don't think most people did. I've seen some people say that they did. And I'm like, wow, it's an amazing school that you went to because I was definitely an adult when I learned about it. And I don't remember learning about it at Howard either, although I didn't take a whole lot of history classes. I mean, I, I took a couple history classes and maybe maybe they did touch on it then, but I don't remember. But I, I have a conscious memory of as an adult reading about um, Black Wall Street and, you know, this section of Tulsa that was was thriving, where black people were thriving in the 20s, so obviously it segregated. And, and there was a thing that happened, someone was accused, a black man was accused of assaulting a white woman, and it turned into not just a riot, because I think I've seen it called a riot, and, and a massacre of that, a decimation of that entire location and the people that lived there. And so Watchmen, this show, opens with that. And in the first episode, you don't necessarily see the connection. I'm sure they're going to draw it as the show goes on. But um, we open in an alternate history, an alternate now, because the original Watchmen was an alternate 1980s. Um, An alternate now where there have been reparations, but there is still a lot of racial strife. And so... We have Regina King as our main character, who is this badass embodiment of justice and feminism. And at one point in the show, she gets a call and she grabs a shotgun, hands it to her husband, tells him to protect the children, and then she leaves to go kick ass. You know, like that is the feminism that black people, that black women need, in my opinion. So yeah, I uh, I really enjoyed the first episode, the world building was, you know, you're immersed in it, it's parceled out, you have questions, it's intriguing to see the differences in the world, and I just really want to know more about it, and I'm really excited to watch more. So last weekend, I was at Capclave uh, in Maryland, my local, it's a local, um, not just science fiction and fantasy conference, but it's literary themed, which is always nice. So there's, there's no one in costumes, they, it's basically, just the panels, and then there's a game room. And um, Martha Wells was there. She was the guest of honor. I didn't actually see her. I basically, I, was, I think I was on four panels. Um, I went to my panels, and I wandered into the game room at some point and learned a couple of new games, which was fun. And then I left, because I'm trying to conserve my energy for the next two weekends of events. And so uh, the panels uh, went really well. I met some other writers, some of whom were local. Um, for the most part, it went pretty smoothly. There's always a couple of hiccups <laughs> on panels. I had done Capclave two years ago, and the way that it's organized is, um, at least this year, but, okay, the way that it works is prior to you kind of sign up for the, the panels that you're interested in, and they choose a moderator, but the moderator doesn't contact you and give you the questions in advance. And I was on two panels where the moderator didn't appear to know that they were moderating, which doesn't seem to be all that unusual at these types of things. When I'm moderating, I spend a lot of time thinking about the questions, um, especially when I'm creating them myself. Uh, Maryland Romance Writers for Baltimore Book Festival does it completely different. And I think because it's women organizing it, they're like, here's the moderators, here's the email addresses, everybody talk about what questions you want, everybody submit questions, and then the moderator will choose. At Capclave, it's just like you sit down and you meet these people right then, and a moderator may or may not have, know that they're moderating and may or may not have prepared in advance. And uh, so it's always a surprise. But there were some really good conversations. There were some frustrating things. There were a lot of assumptions. Um, 
that were made, something that was stated on two different panels that I was on is how in epic fantasy, you know, the hero is usually slash a tinge of should be a young man because older men and women have other responsibilities. They can't go on quests because, you know, they might have families and children to take care of and responsibilities and jobs. And while it is true that it is often, it's very prevalent to have this young man go on a quest at, in fantasy, the sort of shade that I, I perceived at least in, in some of these people who, different people said this on different panels, you know, a, a version of this, was that that's the way it should be because of this, this, and this. And of course, that's that's ridiculous and we have to push back on that. Uh, but there's, it it's also shows how there's often at least a lack of imagination in fantasy. I've heard authors describe their work as, oh, you know, it's another medieval fantasy, as if that's a good thing, you know? And, but there are examples of even quests Quest fantasy where, like Kings of the Wild, which I read last year, which is specifically about middle-aged former uh, questers who are, you know, going back. The main character has a wife and a child, and it is part of it that he's leaving his wife and child, I think against his wife's wishes, you know, to, because he feels like he has to go on this, this quest, this last hurrah. But not just that, to help his friend. Um, Sarah Beth Durst has a book. I didn't read this this one, I read the first one in the series, but in the second book, in the Queen of Tears, uh, Queen of Blood book. So yeah, the second book in the Queens of Renthia, the reluctant queen, the heroine is a mother who gets pulled into a quest. And um, I, I enjoyed the first book in that series. So there are examples of people thinking outside the box, and I think there need to be more thinking outside the box. Um, Another thing that had never occurred to me personally was the statement, again, echoed several times on different panels, that fantasy is inherently conservative. And that literally has never occurred to me before. I, I haven't viewed it that way, possibly because of how I came into fantasy, maybe, or just, just the, the fantasy that I've chosen to focus on reading. I, I haven't read a lot of canon, you know. Um, I came into it, I guess I came into it a little late. Like my speculative fiction, my love of speculative fiction came from TV, came from Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, um, things like that. And then I got into books, because I was always a reader, but I, as a kid I was reading, you know, some speculative stuff, but uh, a lot more just classics. Um, Secret Garden was one of my favorite books ever. Actually, I've reread it recently and I still love Secret Garden. So what I can recall of, of really getting into fantasy and science fiction was as a college student. And that was through Wild Sea, through Octavia Butler. And so then I was just reading all of the black women. Um, you know, I got into Nala Hopkinson, Tanana Reeve Dew, anything black and science fiction and fantasy that I could read. And then I did start reading William Gibson and Neil Stevenson and some of those classic science fiction. But I didn't read Lord of the Rings until right before the movies came out. And um, so I just, I guess I didn't have a history, like a deep history of, you know, I don't know, all of these big names in fantasy. That wasn't my, that's not how I got into it. So I never came in considering that, uh, it was inherently conservative. And the idea that, you know, I was on a panel, two different panels, one on politics and one on democracy and fantasy, where they were like, you know, these the ideas of the returning of an, a king, returning a society to its old way, bringing this back is, is a very conservative idea. And um, that's true, I guess. But it still isn't what fantasy is to me. But it, you know, it is what fantasy is to a lot of people. And I, I take that, you know, everyone comes at it differently. And I'm not, I'm definitely not as well read as a lot of people. And the things that I choose to read now are not going back, you know, into this old, into this um, canon, so to speak. I'm reading things that are, are, are interesting to me, that feel relevant to me. And, uh, 
so yeah, my perspective was just very different than a lot of the people on that I was you know on panels with, and that's always an interesting experience because to see things through someone else's eyes, to see how other people got into it and why they think the way they do, and maybe that's why people feel like they have to or they should or it's expected to write this kind of story in this kind of setting, and because that's what they grew up reading, and it's not what I grew up reading, so I was not pulled in that direction. So my writing update. I did get edits for book three. Yay! If you have been listening for a while, you'll know that that has been on my mind. Um, and there were no edits for book three, so it is with the copy editor right now. Um, every publishing experience is different. I was listening to a podcast with uh, authors, with YA authors, talking about their, their process and their deadlines and these women, you know, had first draft deadlines and first revision, second revision, and third revisions. And I'm like, is your editor reading your first draft? I, I have lots of questions about this. Um, but different publishing houses, different editors at the same publishing houses are just going to have different processes and, and different writers um, and different stories, different books by the same writer. So every single experience is going to be different. On one hand, uh, I'm relieved that I don't have to take focus away from writing book four of Earthsinger Chronicles to do a big revision of book three. Um, on the other hand, you know, I, I do, I'm not, I'm not so arrogant as to believe that, you know, there's nothing about that book that could be better. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a, a blessing and a curse, I think, uh, to not get at it. I do think that I... I get better as a writer through being edited. Um, but there's also the professional concerns and the business aspect of it where, you know, it, it, the business concerns, and, I, and I've talked about this before, like what, what someone in the industry is looking at is, you know, how do I sell this? What my editor and publishing company is looking at is how does this fit into the marketplace? And is this of a high enough quality to to do well in the marketplace? Is it good enough for readers to read and enjoy and want to read the next one? And I think that's what agents are looking at when they review things, and that's what editors are looking at. And I'm looking at it from an artist perspective, and I want I want it to be the best it can possibly be. And I want, you know, a common question that writers get is, how do you know when you're done? And usually someone, my, my answer to that is, someone else tells you when you're done. You get to the point where you can't go any further and you give it to someone else. And they say, no, come, go back, do this, this, you know, look at, take a look at this and this. Or they say, oh, it's good, you're done. And so my editor has told me that I'm done. Um, and it can be difficult. It can be difficult from a creative perspective. Uh, if, if she had come back, you know, with an eight-page editorial letter, that would have also been difficult. <laughs> I think everything has its challenges, so. That's where we are now. I am continuing work on book four of the Arisinger Chronicles. I did go back and reread the second novella, which I also am working on. I did not do a schedule yet, but I reread what I had, which was, it was shorter than I remembered. The first draft right now is at 17,000 words. I'm targeting 25 to 30,000 words for the finished novella, so I have to continue with that plan. I uh, had ups and downs with writing this week. I didn't th I didn't cut anything else, and I actually had like a moment of catharsis with writing a scene. It was a, a brand new scene that I had to add, and I was largely pantsing it. Like I knew, I knew what the character was going through. I knew what, what information I wanted to have come out of the scene. And I didn't know anything else. So I pulled out my Alpha Smart and I set a timer and I just started writing, which is how I usually uh, approach a first draft of anything, any new scene. And I discovered some really interesting things. One of the things that happened is I figured out a way to bring in a subplot that I didn't think I had room for in this book. And it just opened up all kinds of possibilities, not only for this character, but for another character. And motivations became clear. And I was like, oh, if in this scene, you know, this character comes and they have this conflict and she hides it from her family, then I can have this my other character who's her brother. That can become an issue for them. He finds out that she hid this thing and it 
it engaged all of these things that were in my subconscious that I was like, oh, I can bring this in because I I'd had it in earlier drafts of my outline, but this book is weighty. It's the end of the series. I have a lot of threads to tie up. So I was like, I'm going to have to cut that. I don't think I have room, but I'm, I think I can sneak it in. And it was really cathartic. I finished drafting that scene and I just felt this, this high, you know, like one of the great parts of writing are the highs. And that was fantastic. Um, related to pantsing it, <laughs> Uh, Jeffy Kennedy from the First Cup of Coffee podcast, also in the Frolic Network. We're having this asynchronous conversation, as we keep saying. Um, but she was talking about a tweet that she had made about pantsing. She's a pantser, doesn't like the term. I, I, I get that. And um, just commenting about how there's classes trying to teach pantsers how to plot. That it seems like there's a lot of energy in the writing space of trying to change pantsers into plotters. And you do hear this a lot. You hear that as when you turn professional, you have to learn how to plot in order to make deadlines, in order to give synopses, to sell books and proposals and things. And um, I've definitely witnessed that. I'm definitely, I, I call myself a plotter when I am a planter. I think that's the term for being both because I started out writing as a pantser. I, I lost my first couple of NaNoWriMo's pantsing and um, it wasn't until I started to learn to plot that I was able to finish anything. So for me, plotting helps. Actually, the first the first draft of Song of Blood and Stone, which I wrote in two days, was completely pantsed. I woke up one morning, I had this idea, I started writing. I had no idea where it was going. And so it was 21,000 words that needed a year and a half of revision to become anything. And I looked at that and I was like, I had been through writers workshops and you know for years te learn, ostensibly learning writing but none of those writers workshops actually teach you how to plot going to a critique group doesn't teach you how to plot like i had to sit down and teach myself how to tell a story that didn't meander and wander all over the place that had a you know clear goals and i had to learn about motivation and conflict and all of that stuff. And I call it Leslie's plotting school. And that was in like from 2013 to 2014, I put myself through a plotting school of reading books and a lot of blog posts and just studying plotting so that I could turn this mush of an idea that something was there into a book. And also working with my freelance editor helped a lot when I decided to self publish it. So definitely for me, um, Plotting is the only way that I have been able to create something that's an actual book. But inside of that, I still pants. I'm a discovery writer. I, I find the signposts and I, in between those signposts, I just write and I, and I figure out what's happening. And after I've written it, then I know, you know? So like with the scene that I was talking about, after I had written it, I had all these ideas for other plot points that have to happen with other characters and, and all the opportunities that it gives me. And that's pantsing led to plot points. And I feel like that's kind of how it has to happen. I wonder if people are out there like 100% pantsers where they just, they sit down every morning with no clue about what's going to happen and they write and then the next day it's the same thing. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's Maybe that's a thing that works for people. I don't know. And even when you plot, like my plots change all the time. So as I discover things, because I'm a discovery writer, so I write a scene and I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know all the details that were going to happen. And it reveals some new thing that changes the plot. So yeah, like we use these terms, but they're not always super helpful. And they're not always super accurate either. But they're the best we have right now, I guess. So if she does a pantsing class, uh, any of you pantsers out there, stay tuned. I'll let you know because she's talking about doing that, and I think that would be good. I don't, I don't know how you teach pantsing if it's, you know, but I'm sure she'll find a way. And she did call me out on not finishing Good Omens, the TV show, <laughs> casting aspersions against my uh, my good taste or lack thereof. So we'll see. I'm, I will. I'm, I'm strongly considering trying again to watch that show, just because she called me out. 
she kind of dragged me for that, which was funny. But in that vein of, you know, different writers doing different things, K.M. Wyland had a good post on a writer's guide to understanding people. And she had a quote in there which says, most of us are using our writing, whether consciously or unconsciously, not so much as a way to reveal what we understand about people, but rather as a way to figure out ourselves. And, you know, part of the whole plotting versus pantsing debate, if you can call it a debate, is uh, understanding that everybody's different. You know, we're all going to write differently. I don't understand how other people do things and they don't understand how I do things. I'm in my mastermind every week with people who are like, Leslie, I don't know how you're doing that. I don't get it. That does not work for me, but you do you. And likewise, I said the same thing to them. My friend Cerise writes by hand. She writes in Microsoft Word. I don't understand why anybody would do that, but it works for her. So take a step back and just acknowledge that we're all different and we're all going to approach things differently. And that's fine. Don't have a flame war about it. There's no need for it. And it's not useful anyway. I have decided to do a, a version of NaNoWriMo, a Nano Rebel, which is a term I just learned. And so, because I wasn't going to do it because I'm not writing anything new. I'm revising for the foreseeable future. But you can do a revision Nano. So I'm going to do an, a revision Nano. I'm going to revise 50,000 words of book four and uh, see how that goes. Because I do like Nano. We'll see how involved I get with like the communities. I don't know. I'm not committing to going to any write-ins, but maybe an online write-in, online sprint. Sprinting isn't helpful for me for revision, but there's a lot of new scenes that I have to write, um, like a whole section that just doesn't exist in the first draft. So when I'm doing those, when I'm doing those fast drafts, then sprinting is the way that I do that. So that might be a case when I'll, I'll see if there's a, a nearby write-in that I want to subject myself to. <laughs> write-ins can be hit or miss for me because people do a lot of talking and um, it's nice to get out of the house and talk to people and meet people but like I need to write and to focus. This week I also uh, had the opportunity to talk to a class of high school students via the internet there in uh, Pennsylvania and I had I talked to so there's a teacher who my agent I think had introduced me to and she teaches creative writing and so I talked to the class her class last year and she had asked me to come back and do it again and it was basically a Q&A session they were really really interesting kids really good questions um, one of the questions that I got was about self-published versus trad pub because I kind of start off with my my trajectory of how I got to here and starting out self-published and then and being picked up by a traditional publisher. And, you know, I give the answer of, you know, it depends on your goals and it depends on, you know, your personality and, and things like that. But one thing that I wish I would have said is about having an impact. Um, and I think that in one of the classes that I've done, you know, you, you kind of assess yourself. One of the questions you have to ask yourself, and why do you want to be a writer? Why do you want to be an author? Uh, what do you want out of your career? Is it money? Is it um, awards? Is it recognition? Is it, you know, what do you want to have happen? For some people, the answer is going to be, I want to have an impact on the world. And that's one of my reasons. And I think that it is easier to have an impact when you're traditionally published. Now, I don't know if this is going to be controversial, so let me know if you feel like I'm, I'm way off. One of the things people say a lot is that self-publishers can sell 500 books and make the same amount or more as a traditionally published author who sells 5,000 books. And that can be very true. Your royalties are higher. You don't have to sell as many books to make as much or way more money. Completely true. But depending on why you wanted to be an author, if I can sell 5,000 books, regardless of money, that's 5,000 people who have read it versus 500, that has the potential to have a bigger impact on society, culture, the world, all of these lofty things. It has the potential to have more readers. Do I want more readers for less money or fewer readers for more money? I think I did the fewer or less thing right. <laughs> so, and that's, you know, people are gonna have different, different reasons. Like if money is your primary goal, then absolutely, you know, at whatever way you, you can make money, the number of readers you have is less important to you. I think for me, more readers as opposed to less readers, fewer readers, is, is a thing that's important to me. Because since I've always wanted to write, 
I think in the back of my mind, it is because of the books that have affected me and changed me and helped me through hard times. And there's a bigger opportunity for impact just on a, on a numbers basis. So I think that's going to be part of my answer going forward from now on about self-pub versus pursuing trad pub um, and asking the question of what you want to get out of this. So this episode has gotten a little long, but I have one last thing. There's a, a tweet that I'll link to in the show notes by V.E. Schwab uh, on Twitter. There's a tweet, right? I said that. So this is her quote. I was once on a panel and another author essentially said, if you don't enjoy every moment, then why are you here? And I was exasperated. Creativity is a complicated beast. You don't have to love every second to be a valid participant. I'm not here because I love every second. I'm here because the parts I love are worth the rest. And I thought that that was a really good thing to remember, especially as, you know, I've just, I've talked to a lot of authors in the couple last few weeks who have been going through various trials and tribulations with the publishing industry. And uh, it's not going to be possible to enjoy every moment of anything, the things you love. I've talked about joy and what does Jeffrey Kennedy call it? Gladness. You know, these things keep us going. And so like having that cathartic moment when I wrote that scene this week was just like, yes, you know, you feel the heavens opening up and angels singing. <laughs> there are moments when you feel like this is wonderful. I love it so much. And then there's other moments that I've talked about before and I will again. So I continue because the parts that I love are worth the rest. They are by far worth it. Um, in my experience so far. So that keeps me going when, when through the disappointments and the frustration and all the rest. So I will entreat you to, you know, focus on the parts that you love and, and hopefully they will push you through. So that's it for me for this week. I hope you all have a wonderful week of reading and writing and living your wonderful best lives. For episode show notes and to learn more about me and my books, go to lpenelope.com. You can subscribe to My Imaginary Friends wherever you get your podcasts and check out the video episodes on YouTube. My Imaginary Friends is now part of the Frolic Podcast Network. For more podcasts you'll love, check out frolic.media slash podcasts. Happy reading.